On today's episode of the Katie Halper Show, we're really excited to bring you an interview with Gabe Arana, the media editor at the Huffington Post. He talks to us about undergoing ex-gay conversion therapy. Spoiler alert, it may not work because he's now married to a man. And we go over the best lines of the GOP debate and why Ben Carson sounds like a serial killer. And Gabe Arana tells us five ways journalists can avoid being Islamophobic in their reporting. Then as a special bonus, we go over the Republican debate with Scott Lemieux, a professor of political science at the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York, with a focus on the Supreme Court and constitutional law. He's also a frequent contributor to the American Prospect and a blogger for Lawyers, Guns, and Money. And Scott counts for us which of the proposals from this week's GOP debate actually constitute war crimes. So listen to the end of the episode to hear that. And next week, make sure you check out the show. December 23rd, we'll be talking to folk singer Dar Williams live at our studios in Brooklyn. She'll also be performing on December 26th at the Bell House. You can hear the Katie Halper Show with Katie Halper, Gabe Pacheco, and Reggie Johnson every Wednesday at 6 p.m. live on WBAI. That's 99.5 FM or WBAI.org. And you can also check out the podcast at iTunes, SoundCloud. Follow us on SoundCloud. Subscribe to us on iTunes, rate us, review us, give us some stars, give us five stars. Check out our interview from last week with Jeremy Newberger, director of the film The Anthropologist, which screened at COP21, as well as Sam Alkoff from Democracy Now! He tells us how he knows that the French man who almost killed him in a car accident was not Putin. I'm still not convinced. See you next week. Hello, and welcome to the Katie Halper Show. I'm your host, Katie Halper. I'm here in a room full of Gabes. Uh, I'll explain that in a second, but for now, you should know, as you always know, you can always hear the Katie Halper Show on Wednesdays, 6 p.m. on WBAI. That's 99.5 FM or WBAI.org. Wednesday, 6 p.m., basically everything else stops, and you run to either your phone, the Internet, what have you, You listen to the Katie Albert Show. Am I right? Silent nods all around the room. 100%. That's what we do. 100%. Thank you, Gabe. And speaking of which, we have a great show for you guys today. We have in in the studio, as usual, usual, we have (laughs) Gabe Pacheco. Hi, I'm here. Gabe Pacheco, very funny man. My uh, my girl Friday, I often call you. My girl, my boy Wednesday is what I call you. My guy Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> and on the engineering boards, on, on the, the boards, on the boards, because he doesn't like wow. when I give him fancy descriptions. I, I, no, I was like, I was a like, hey Katie, hey, hey Reggie, Gabe. How are you? We have an extra <laughs> Gabe in the room today because sometimes I want to have an extra Gabe because you never know what's going to happen. One Gabe could go down. There could be a Gabe missing. A Gabe <laughs> casualty. You have a backup Gabe. Like an external hard drive. Yes. We have with us in studio the very smart, I was going to call you clever, but that sounds sinister, the very smart, prolific writer, journalist, I'm going to just say intellectual, Gabe Arana. Oh, I like that. It's good, right? Yeah. Better than the thug that you're usually called by the <laughs> by the right wing, right? That's right. And Gabe Arana is the editor of the Huffington Post media section, Vertical. That's right. Right? What have you. HuffingtonPost.com forward slash media that's where you can find it yeah but what's your actual what's it called when you say i'm the editor of i just say i run the media section got it so you're like a jew just kidding i can say that everyone because i'm a jew and we don't really run it but uh yeah gabe he is the gabe Arana. i just got that Thank I, you. Ju- I just got that one i was a little slow i just got that one. gabe Arana is the media editor at the huffington post you can find him at gabriel Arana on twitter and he's also has written for places like The Nation, The American Prospect. We're so excited. We've been wanting to have him. And we're going to talk to you guys about a lot of different things. We're going to give you a little um, report back on the, the great GOP debates. Do you guys watch those? Uh, oh. I, I, I saw, yeah. I saw like yeah. the first 35, 40 minutes, you okay. know. I, I tried to pay attention every time Ben Carson came on. My, yes. uh, my eyes got, I, st- I yawned a little um, bit. Um, I yawned. What, Reggie? No, what? I, I had better things to do like watching paint dry. Okay. Mm-hmm. They painted a pretty pretty scary picture of the world, those yeah. guys. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of fear-mongering last night. You know, it's just like... It's called reality. Well, I just thought we could share some of the greatest moments, and it's really hard to whittle them down from the Republican debate. But first of all, I noticed something. I have a very astute observation, which is that 
Ted Cruz is basically Marco Rubio if Marco Rubio had his head stuck between elevator doors. <laughs> like smushed. 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 Like a distorted yeah. Rubio. Yeah. Like a longer distorted Rubio. An elongated Rubio. An elongated, flattened, like Rubio delivered with forceps. Yeah. An elongated Rubio sounds like a prank you play on your, mm, your mm. friends in college. Oh, God. Sort of like uh, the opposite to what Stewie, Stewie Griffin from Family Guy. Right. I think yeah. he looks like Herman Munster. If you look online. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. One of my favorite things was that this is something that Lowell, LOL GOP pointed out, was that a lot of things that they put forward were actually war crimes. A lot of their plans violate the Geneva like they Convention. Sa- like they sound like something like Slobodan Milosevic exactly. could have said. They actually lifted this. I think a lot of their platforms come kind of from Slobodan Milosevic's manual. Like Pol Potish. ish Pol Pot-esque, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. So I want to play for us. Uh, none of us here is a lawyer. None of us no. is a legal scholar, no. but I did very well in my undergraduate. I'm not a, a barrister. <laughs> Are you a silk? <laughs> a silk or a barrister or what's the other a word? Silk. A solicitor? A, sol- a yeah, counselor, uh, an esquire. Is those the English terms of uh, attorney? Yeah, and rake. I know rake, rake from aus- this Australian show. But oh. what I did was I did a little mashup. I would love to have put a beat under this, but I didn't have time. But like this girl talk. You're like the DJ girl, I am the girl talk. I'm the political girl talk. Okay. I'm like woman talk to power. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. So I did a little mashup of the most war crime-esque plans presented by various GOP people. I'm Josh Jacob from Georgia Tech. Recently, Donald Trump mentioned that we must kill the families of ISIS members. How would intentionally killing innocent civilians set us apart from ISIS? Good question. We have people that know what's going on. You take a look at just the attack in California the other day. There were numerous people, including the mother, that knew what was going on. They saw a pipe bomb sitting all over the floor. They saw ammunition all over the place. They knew exactly what was going on. I would be very, very firm with families. And frankly, that will make people think. Because they may not care much about their lives, but they do care, believe it or not, about their families. He sounds like a tough mom when he's like, like when he talks about going into the room and he's like, you, you, you know what they're doing. Well, they got the pipes. They, I, oh you got the pipes God. on the ground. <laughs> oh, you got oh the, God, you got, the I know what line. you're doing in here. I know what you're doing in here. It's like they saw a pipe bomb sitting all over the floor, <laughs> yeah. all over the floor. Senator Cruz, you have said you would, quote, carpet bomb ISIS into oblivion. Does that mean leveling the ISIS capital of Raqqa in Syria, where there are hundreds of thousands of civilians? You would carpet bomb where ISIS is, not a city, but the location of the troops. Then you have Rubio saying, if If you're an American citizen and you decide to join up with ISIS, we're not going to read you your Miranda rights. You're going to be treated as an enemy combatant, a member of an army attacking this country. The internationalist in me almost likes that. I like that. Like, you're going to be killing Muslims kill American Muslims. I don't want your rights to be privileged over the rights of non-U.S. citizen Muslims. Thank you. Oh. Marco. Wow. Well, oh, oh. I'm, yeah. I'm owning wow. it. No, that I mean, was, I'm being that, facetious, wow. obviously. That, uh, yeah. Some, a part of me is like, look, if you're going to be a terrible person, be a terrible person who also... Why does somebody who doesn't have An equal America? opportunity. Exactly. So it's a little weird to be an internationalist who gets excited about expanding the Muslim killing program. And I obviously don't. But it is a little bizarre when people are like, I don't care if we kill non-American Muslims and violate their human rights. But you better not touch a hair on an American Muslim. So I would just like to thank Marco Rubio for inserting that internationalist Marxist perspective, which we all know he has. As, a, <laughs> as, as someone who fled. He didn't flee, by the way. You know he always says he fled he Castro? Fled. Yeah, no. Right. Batista, pre-Castro. His family left during Batista. Every really? time he mentions yeah. that, you should know this. His family left during the dictator before Castro. I happen to really be, you know, crazily enough, as a person who has a radio show on WBI, I'm less anti-Castro than most North Americans. But p- he pitches himself as a real Iridian, right? And he's right. trying to get the exile vote. As though he was leaving the communist uh, exactly. uh, uh, oppression, whereas, in fact, he was he was leaving, like, uh, the, the landed elite exactly. oligarchy, plantation owner. plantation, hacienda, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Capitalist thing, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like the Copacabana days, Bacardi rulership. When Hyman Roth was, yeah. was running gambling down there in Godfather 2. Yes. Hyman. Can you say that on the radio? I believe it's a medical that. medical term. Oh, yeah, okay. it, it, it it's, is. it's a medical and, term. And a Jewish name. I mean, if yeah. they exist. I don't know if they exist. They're Do they? Not, no, they're a myth, like okay. unicorns. I have to say that the best one of all, really the best one, was when Hugh Hewitt, that's his real name apparently, he asked Ben Carson, who's a... a neurosurgeon yeah, and he never lets you forget that he doesn't and he said yeah everything has a tumor metaphor <laughs> <laughs> or li- but what's scarier is that this is a literal one and it's a s- kind of a simile but here we go ready hugh hewitt big right-wing libertarian with the radio show 
says to Ben Carson during the debate. You mentioned in your opening remarks that you're a pediatric neuro uh, neurologist surgeon. Neurosurgeon. And neurosurgeon. And people admire and respect and are inspired by your life story, your kindness, your evangelical core support. We're talking about ruthless things tonight. Carpet bombing, toughness, war. And people wonder, could you do that? Could you order airstrikes that would kill innocent children by not the scores, but the hundreds and the thousands? Could you wage war as a commander in chief? You should see the eyes of some of those children. This is the best. When I say to them, we're going to have to open your head up and take out this tumor. What? They're not happy yeah, about it. This is the best. Me. And they don't like me very much at that point. And by the same token, you have to be able to look at the big picture. It's actually merciful if you go ahead and finish the job rather than death by a thousand pricks. So you are okay with the deaths of thousands of innocent children and civilians. It's, it's like, you got it. You got it. He's got that skin crawling, could, that tone put, yeah. that's so calm when he's saying something so horrific. But, but let's just say what just happened here. Basically, he was asked if he had the guts and the conviction to kill innocent people. And his response was, yes, I do. And to prove that point, I'm going to tell you a story about my experience as a neurosurgeon. Yes. It's... He points to his experience as a neurosurgeon to prove he's capable of killing innocent people. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes him a worse politician or a worse doctor. It's like the opposite of the Hippocratic Oath. Yes. Do harm first. <laughs> Any parent who would now take their kid to that doctor should have their kids taken from them. You know, Dr. Carson came on WBAI back what? in the 90s. And the way Dr. Carson is talking now is way different from what he used to talk back in the 90s. He used to be on WBAI speaking a different tune. So uh, now, did he also have like a personality back then? I mean, because he looks like he's on a he lot of had, uh, drugs. Uh, I mean, his tone was the same, but it was more human. Mm -hmm. It was definitely more human. Okay. I mean, because his tone was always the same. Like very chamomile tea. His right, tone is right, really... right. It was always the same. But this is this guy wasn't the guy that used to be on WBAI. Not the guy that, that Reggie fell in love with. Despite Ben Carson's affect, which is sort right. of like a Labrador lobotomized, right. I find him the most terrifying. Because if you actually listen to what he's saying, it is terrifying. Yeah, yeah. This, this sweet demeanor, and then what he's saying is totally horrific. So when you stare at the eyes of a child and you're telling him you're about to open up his head, that is uh, serial killer talk. It's really Sounds scary. Sounds very Dr. Lecter. <laughs> yeah. Who is also mild-mannered. Uh -huh. You're right. And, and very refined and cultured. Hey there, children. I'm going to open you up. You so, see the tumor inside your head. So he You're says... You're not going to like it. So but he, it must be done. War crime. War crime. So he says, by the same token, you have to be able to look at the big picture and understand that's actually merciful if you go ahead and finish the job, rather than death by a thousand pricks. So now he's comparing his uh, neurosurgery to a mercy killing. Like a euthanasia. Yeah. Which like, is something that you are okay with if you're an evangelical Christian? Probably or not. not. Okay. If you bring your kid in for a, an operation on a brain tumor and he decides to euthanize your kid. He's like, we're not going to give your child any shots. We're just yeah. going to. It's one... from zero to 100. One extreme. <laughs> why not? Why, why, yeah. why, why prolong the experience? Better than death by a thousand pricks. We're just going to kill your kid. It's probably like he has like a, you know, a totally treatable infection. Really like the theme of murdering children. They just too. kept coming up over it's the, like a, a motif. kind of a, a light motif. Exactly. Yes. We are so on the same wavelength. I think that yesterday is going to go down in history as the day that the day when Ben Carson said he was prepared to kill innocent kids because of his experience as a neurosurgeon. I'm predicting. That. Oh, my God. Gabe, wait, what's the deal? We don't know this Gabe Arana, but Gabe Pacheco, when he laughs covers the mic and Gabe Arana just did that too own it laugh into the mic <laughs> all right also did you guys notice that Ben Carson he said theater I don't care whether it's a mosque a school a supermarket you know a theater theater instead of theater which sounds pretty un-American to me I mean I'm fine with that but he said that I thought he <laughs> more would, of like, an English himself. is that a more of an English pronunciation I think so. theater. 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 theater did you guys hear what Donald Trump was saying about the internet? Does he kind of believe that it's a tangible, like, uh, like oh yeah, like hold on, object one second, yeah, yeah, we're gonna, it's like a thing, it's kind of like pipe on the ground, like yeah, you know, you yeah, know, yeah. Just, there's valves. You recently suggested uh, closing that internet up; those were your words, as a way to stop ISIS from recruiting online. Are you referring to closing down actual 
portions of the Internet. This is so easy to answer. ISIS is using the Internet better than we are using the Internet, and it was our idea. What I wanted to do is I wanted to get our brilliant people from Silicon Valley and other places and figure out a way that ISIS cannot do what they're doing. I don't want them using our Internet and watching the media talking about how they're masterminds. These are masterminds. They shouldn't be using the word mastermind. These are thugs. These are terrible people in ISIS, not masterminds. And we have to change it from every standpoint. But we should be using our brilliant people, our most brilliant minds, to figure a way that ISIS cannot use the Internet. And then on second, we should be able to penetrate the Internet and find out exactly where ISIS is and everything about ISIS. And we can do that if we use our good people. Are you open to closing parts of the Internet? I would certainly be open to closing areas where we are at war with somebody. I sure as hell don't want to let people that want to kill us and kill our nation use our Internet. Yes, sir, I am. What does it even mean to close parts of the Internet? How can you do that? You can. How can you do that? It password protect all of the, uh, you know, it's like when you're your Wi-Fi. So my, gotta, my yeah. husband is He's a software hard. engineer at Google, and I'm always asking him weird questions about technology. <laughs> And he answers them, and one of my questions the other day was, could you shut down the internet? And he said it would basically be impossible because the internet isn't, as you mentioned, a (laughs) a single entity. It's not tangible. Right. That Donald Trump can throw against a wall. There's not one building with no windows that mysteriously houses all of the information in the world. But here's what it reminded me of. There's two clips. ISIS.com. ISIS.com shut down backslash forever. There are two clips from, a, from this movie. I think that Donald Trump has a very similar understanding of the Internet as do the main characters in Zoolander. And if you've seen that movie, it's a great movie about two male models who form an un- unlikely friendship and defeat child labor. But listen to the way that they interact with this computer. They're trying to turn a computer on in this scene. There must be an on button somewhere. To press the Apple thing. Either it's unclear that's from Zoolander or it's from a documentary about Donald Trump trying to turn on a computer. And trying then, to defeat ISIS on trying the to internet. Defeat, yeah, ISIS. There's a clip of Zoolander slash of, of Donald Trump actually destroying the ISIS evidence that lets them attack our country. Ready? Here's, here's the, the next clip. No way, compadre. We got 30 years worth of files right here in this computer that are going to bring you down. Oh, no. Ah, damn! Okay, sorry. That Where'd was actually files go. Where'd all the files go? That was actually Donald Trump um, opening the files that ISIS <laughs> had to, in order to ruin their. Uh, their I plans, believe. Yeah. I believe that he believes that the internet is some kind of tangible building that exists yeah, that somewhere in the bottom of the ocean, you somewhere like that. You I know, mean, the, the psychology of Donald Trump is really simple. It's the psychology of a schoolyard. I mean, even the internet. That was our idea. That's right. Mine. Don't you don't you use our don't Stop even using my using, internet and don't call yourself a mastermind. That's mine. Stop <laughs> I'm the smartest it. one in here. Why are you using it? Give it back. You know, you're funny looking and you smell. You're not being fair to me. Yeah, you're not. He's oh, Eric, my God. He's the Eric best Cartman. is when he yells at people. He's like, he says to Jeb, excuse me, I'm talking. You going to apologize to me? <laughs> you're not apologizing to me. Yeah. Yeah. Am I not talking or are you talking, Jeb? I'm you talking right back. now. I'm talking. You can go back. You're not talking. talking. You interrupted me, September 30th, Are you going to apologize, seven. Jeb? No. Am I allowed to finish? Yes, one at a time. Excuse go ahead, me. Mr. Am I allowed to finish? Go ahead, Mr. Trump. So, little of your again, own I, there, right? I, don't, I, I love that. He gets so self-righteous. Right. Or with Megyn Kelly, remember when he's like, you, you know, I'm not. I'm very nice to you. I shouldn't be because how you're treating me now. He's Eric Cartman. Another part that I really like: Ted Cruz quoted FDR's grandfather about horse thieves. Well, you know, I'm reminded of what uh, FDR's grandfather said: all horse thieves are Democrats, but not all Democrats are horse thieves. Ted Cruz 
knows what what resonates with the people. I was like, what this is like FDR this grandfather is like quotes a bad horse thief. A quote out of Tombstone or something. Yeah, like uh, <laughs> was... like who knows what a horse thief is? Now? I know, and also that's the grandfather of the guy who started the New Deal. Aren't you supposed to be anti northeastern yeah, elitist? Really. Then yeah, I had some drinking games that for next time for next debate because they're about seventy five, right? So the next time that yeah. we have another GOP debate. Drink every time Chris Christie says as a former federal prosecutor. I will tell you this. I'm a former federal prosecutor. As a former federal prosecutor, this is the difference between actually having been a federal prosecutor. Now, listen, I'm a former federal prosecutor. On September 10th, 2001, I was named chief federal prosecutor in New Jersey. I'm- Only if you have a high tolerance. And can you tell us about Gabe? Uh, Which one? Gabe, 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 who's half Mexican. <laughs> uh. Oops. Gabe, and has brown hair and brown eyes. And is handsome like that no uh gabe arana can you tell us about this article that you wrote for the huffington post about how to avoid islamophobia in reporting so it was a follow-up to an article i did about how bad islamophobia was in the media because every time there's a terrorist attack the country including the media seems to lose its mind and there's an incredible flattening of the entire muslim world that goes on and as journalists it's our duty to portray the world in all of its texture and nuance, not to treat it like a video, not to treat international politics like a video game, which if if you watch cable news is basically what what the show is. Despite intellectual, nuanced intellectuals like um, Donald Trump, it's still, he's not able to shift the We 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 see what you're doing. We see what your families are doing. (laughs) You're laying down some pipe, a bunch of pipe all over the place. We just got to cut off that part of the internet, you know? Oh my gosh, yeah. So you wrote Says this... the man with the doll hair. Troll doll. Troll doll. He's, that's like way too hot, actually, to... Yeah, that makes him sound way more attractive than he is. But so you wrote this article, <laughs> um, Five Ways Journalists Can Avoid Islamophobia in Their Coverage, which was on Huffington Post. Can you, can you go over the kind of, you know, basic explanation of the five ways so that our listeners, when they cover it, can make sure that they dot their... Eyes and cross For cheese. all of us journalists out there, vloggers out there, bloggers out there. Smoggers. <laughs> sure. So. Joggers. What's a smogger? I'll tell you about it later. Oh, okay. A blogger who smokes. Mm-hmm. Ah. Al Giordano. Ah, Al Giordano, ah, hope ah, you're listening. Um, news. It's especially bad on television. If you watch television news uh, in the wake of a terrorist attack, it's horrifying. And the most basic observation I had... Um, is that these anchors know nothing about what they're talking about. Um, (laughs) You know, which they're sort of, it's not like those of us who work with words, we go and do research and then write articles. These are people who get up every day, go into the studio and start Look at themselves in the mirror. Yeah. So I think my first recommendation was that everyone who reports on issues that touch on the Muslim world should know more about Islam, should know more about the diversity of the Muslim. You actually say visit a mosque. Yeah. Gabe, that's something that I think everyone on stage last night, the GOP debate, would like to criminalize. <laughs> Are you aware well, that Well, they'd you're... like to criminalize the mosque first. Yeah, it's true. You're right. You're right, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's evident how, how much empathy... I mean, whether it's, whether it's the GOP debate or watching people fight and scream on cable news, it's striking how little empathy people have for, you know, these people that... We're going to carpet bomb or what were the other carpet treat bomb. like they have a tumor and right. are terrified of you. Right. Um, Euthanize. Yes. <laughs> uh, so my first my first suggestion is that every journalist who reports on these issues should visit a mosque, should know a Muslim person. Um, and it's not that it's the duty of the Muslim community right. to educate us. It's our duty as journalists and as um, people who are explaining the world and contextualizing it to know more than the audience to know more about islam than the average person and i'm sure if you gave people in the media a survey of you know asking basic questions about islam and the muslim world they would not do better than the than the general public right yeah there's tons of ignorance i mean it's funny i almost there's so much ignorance about this issue and People haven't really been talking about this, but there have been a lot of Islamophobic attacks in the wake of the Paris attacks. And one of the things that people kind of don't acknowledge is that there's a total double standard, right, in terms of a separation of church and state is 
tolerated versus the separation of mosque and state, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, I find myself, this is totally WBAI inner circle talk. Guys who listen to this show and Fox News don't listen. But I find myself actually doing the opposite where I bend over backwards and I'm more tolerant of Islam than I am of Judaism and Christianity because they're, it's such a hard thing to be in, in this country and on an international level too, although obviously the population is bigger. But I remember hearing once about these cab drivers who wouldn't pick up people with dogs. And I was like, well, that's their religion. They can do that. And my friend was like, Katie, you would never say like Christian cab drivers or Jewish cab drivers could do that. I like, think if Christians were actually marginalized in any way exactly, in this country, the then I would. No, that's exactly the issue. Then they would it is a question of marginalization. There's a war on Christmas. I don't know what you guys <laughs> yeah, are talking about. Yeah, get your head about. out of your bum. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Although Fox News declared the war on Christmas over because at the debate, Wolf Blitzer wished the audience Merry Christmas. Are you serious? Yes. So. This was a huge victory. But... Oh. Do they know he's Jewish? That's probably why it's such a coup, right? If it was a Christian guy, they wouldn't have oh, been so excited they convert- about it. So they converted. So not only that he said Merry Christmas, but he converted. N- I don't think he converted. It more shows the power of Christmas that it infiltrates. Oh, I, see. <laughs> I mean, I-, I see. Even though, as I always like to point out, we, they, we should get, Jews should get some credit for giving birth to the guy who, you know, who we celebrate on Christmas. Mm hmm. Who is from Palestine. Yes, that's very, very true. Yeah. And is brown skin. And hangs out with prostitutes all the time. And hangs out with 12 other guys during the night. Oh, yeah, and they have fabulous dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to celebrate important occasions. Gabe Arana, what observations do you have about the way the media is covering the pending elections? If you look on television, it's all theater and it's all Trump. If you actually, theater. The, theater. If you actually look at the number of times that Trump is mentioned versus any other candidate. It's like a ratio of nine to one. And it's like really extreme when you compare Trump and and uh, Bernie Sanders, right? That's right. Although not on Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow loves Bernie Sanders. Good for Rachel. Are you saying that because you've been on the Rachel Maddow show? No, because I watched the Rachel Maddow Good for show. You. Yeah, but full disclosure, we we are very into transparency. And you were you were on Rachel Maddow show, right? Am I yeah. making that up? And you were talking about X K therapy. That piece I wrote. Actually, I don't know if you know this because it's just coming out today. This infamous reparative therapy clinic for transgender youth is set to close. Think Progress has a piece on it. And Gabe, as someone, Gabe Arana, as someone who's gone through ex gay conversion therapy and is now married to a man, how sad are you that this is closing? Not sad at all. It's called the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. Canada's largest mental health center is closing the Child, Youth, and Family Gender Identity Clinic following a damning independent review that detailed antiquated practices still in use and an evident anti-transgender bias. That's so weird that they that an ex-gay therapy program would have an anti-transgender bias. You'd think they'd be very trans-accepting. Does it say what any of the practices were? Because usually if you look at them, they're ridiculous. Well, let's see. Um, these kids would be subjected to play therapy in which they were forced to play with gender-conforming toys, and parents would be instructed to schedule more play dates with the same sex. Do they also watch, like, heteronormative rom-coms? Or just gay ones. <laughs> to ease them in. That's how they get them, yeah. I don't know. But are there survivor groups? There are. The people I know who's, who've also gone through ex gay therapy, it's sort of an informal alumni network. We interact on the blogosphere, shoot each other occasional emails. Some of us are writers uh, and have written about our experiences. So there aren't really support groups. Uh, not. Okay. Thankfully, there aren't that many people who go through that quote unquote therapy. You know, Lots of times when we have guests on, we talk about politics, but we also get into the biography because it's just interesting, right? Because the politics is the personal. Personal is the personal political, is yeah. political. Okay. But Gabe Arana, you really have a uh, like a fascinating story because you're one of the uh, autodidacts. I was born and raised by lefties. Like I don't like the word liberal because it's too centrist. Like that's why it's just a shameful word for me. Ugh. And Gabe, Gabe Pacheco, you're fairly similar. It, oh it's yeah, a different. Strain, I, I didn't. But I didn't fall far from the tree. I didn't have right, to. I didn't the, have to make a, a journey from the know. patchouli tree, if you yeah. will. Yeah. So, but Gabe Arana, you did, and you're not. You, I've read you, and I've talked to you about this. You don't like throw your family under the bus, but you've come a far distance from where they come from, kind of ideologically. So, I have no. I'm like fascinated by how that happens. Sure. So I grew up on the U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona, Nogales, Arizona, and I'd sort of describe my family as passively conservative. 
they hold conservative views, but sort of passively. So I so, so they I like drive of... by and they kind of, they don't they don't <laughs> punt, they don't push them out of the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, but they sort of they're both lawyers. They make a lot of money, so of course they vote Republican, and they just sort of fall into that camp. I really wasn't politically aware until I was in high school, and then I became very religious. I was raised Catholic, but never went to church, and then started going a lot. There were a lot of things I liked about it. I liked the theater. Right. The theater. It. Uh-huh. Um, I like the art. Uh, the I also costumes? Thought, yes. Or the outfits? What do they call them? Yeah. Frocks. Uh, frocks. They're called frocks. Frocks and crocs. <laughs> it's and my double line of shoes and uh, cossacks. Yeah. I also found Catholicism very organized. It is. <laughs> it's very organized. Yeah. And so as a teenager, that, that, that appealed to me. Uh, and so, are structure. you someone who likes organization and structure and routine? Selectively, I right. would say. I mean, I like it because I lack it. But do you like it because you actually have it? No. Oh, you're okay. You're like me. Whereas this, the other Gabe in the room. Like, I like a clean house, but I don't like to clean. Yes. Yes. That's me, too. But Gabe, this Gabe, I don't think of you as really loving cleaning, but I feel like you need organization. You can't. I can't. I can't live in chaos. Right. I can, and I w- and then I'm like, I lament it, but I. It's a hard thing for me to. I make lists. I make a list of things to do tomorrow yeah. uh, at night. You know, and he's then kind of at, like Claire yeah. from um, Homeland. Oh yeah, with the, with the sheets, but I more organized. I, I didn't think that I would like that show, the first episode, because Claire was too, it was too, too close, close to, to home. home. I know. And then and now I realize that that's yes, you Miss Dan's and I. Yes. So, okay, so you were into Catholicism, and then what happens? Not liberation theology like Oscar Romero, who was killed. No. Not like, like that kind. Okay. Super conservative Catholicism. Okay. And again, the, the immature teenager in, in me liked the, the rules, the organization. And I was a little bit authoritarian mm. back then. Perfect mm. for the Catholic <laughs> Church. Like. Well, I, yeah, I feel like we all start off with like a very black, white, like authoritarians. Like, you know, you're looking for like this is right and that's wrong. Is that? Yeah. I liked being bossy and I felt like Catholicism... <laughs> Armed me with the information to be right and order people around. Ooh, righteousness. Yes. yes. <laughs> Were you also like, fun. go to confessional? Yeah. I, I used to teach Sunday school uh, <laughs> catechism. Um, and you... I really liked telling other people what to do. <laughs> so then what happened? What made you leave that? Uh, then, so as much as I like telling people what to do, uh, I'm bad at following rules myself. Um, I think it's called being a hypocrite. Mm. <laughs> um, the religious religions are very good at that. Yeah. So as as religious as I was, um, the moment I went to college, I started sleeping with everybody on the planet, um, not women. Oh, I was going to say that's you know we do hold half the, the half the sky, <laughs> Gabe. I, I read that book. I know. It's fine to exclude us sexually, but you you know you want to acknowledge that. Um, you don't want to be homonormative. <laughs> Exactly. Wow, it's what's that word again? Homonormative. I gotta remember that. But you, so you, but can you also tell us about if you're if you're up for it about the ex gay conversion? Therapy? Sure. So when my parents found out I was gay, you know, at the, at the time there was very little. There was a lot less internet. There was a lot less information on the internet about homosexuality. Uh, so my mother finds out her kid's gay. You know, her instinct is to go to the computer and find out more about it. Um, found out about the National Association for the Research and Therapy of Homosexuality, which is a... NARTH? NARTH? NARTH. Sounds so benevolent. Yes. Said no one ever. It almost yeah. sounds like a, fed, a fed, branch of the federal government. It's, and, yeah. it's meant to sound scientific and sort of neutral. Like right. even the, the group that released the abortion videos, the Center for oh, Medical yeah. Progress. Progress, yeah. You know, if, they have these... if it's not opposite day. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Um, I started having therapy with the president of uh, the former president uh, at that time of this organization and for three and a half years talked about my sexual orientation, talked about how I grew up uh, in the hope that discovering whatever childhood trauma made me gay, um, talking enough about it would cure me of of my homosexuality. Um, And after three and a half years... uh, of talking to this therapist once a week, once every two weeks, um, I decided it wasn't working, and I still thought that being gay was wrong, but I, I didn't think I could do anything. You were like about a lost it. cause, kind yeah. Of. So that was sort of how I saw myself as I went to college, um, 
and then eventually the conflict between my behavior and you know me okay. and the ideas I grew up with um, they say came to fixed a head. itself yes oh, yeah. <laughs> and and so how did you like what kind of role models did you have for knowing that this was an okay lifestyle so I went to Yale and as soon as I went there you just did the right thought, wing just had a huge boner right now when you heard <laughs> they're like you see it's true what they what we say about those Ivy League liberal places yeah um, well, first I thought every Jewish person was gay. Um, You're kind of onto something there. <laughs> but because of their mannerisms? Or yeah. The so, me- yeah, it's, yeah. So you were like, you watched Seinfeld and you were like, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, Jewish so men, I... straight Jewish men do do the, the leg cross thing. They do the cross-legged thing. Which yeah, is and a... just the sort of like standards, you know, for masculinity are totally oh, different. Yeah. I didn't grow up with Jews. That's um, so funny you say that. Seriously, I know someone who's from actually from the Tex-Mex border and he dates a lot of Jewish women and I think part of it and we talked about this is because they I think I'm generalizing but there's more of a fluid kind of gender is less uh, binary for Jews I'm not like romanticizing it there's tons of homophobia in it I just mean that the, in terms of the mannerisms and the affect there's like a kind of an intellectual thing that- I had to hone my gaydar right um, You're like, wow, every single guy from New York City is, is gay. Well, that's not so off either. Is it just because they were so different culturally from uh, what you grew up with in, no- like, Nogales, you said? Yeah, so yeah. the way I saw boys act was mm-hmm. not how Jewish boys acted. Mm-hmm. And I had barely left the state until I was 18. I'd been to California for vacations with my family, but my mom doesn't fly. So that was my first time on the East Coast around this many Jewish people. Now most of my friends are Jewish. Right. My husband's Jewish. Um, Masatov. <laughs> yeah, well, you live in New York. It's it's hard to not be. You can't exclude. Yeah. Gabe tries. It, Gabe Pacheco, he <laughs> swats them out of the way. I've been with him on the street. He tries yeah, to. I mean, well, the, the, you can't see me, listeners, but... Uh, yeah, pretty. Do you know what I test really well in that demographic. Yeah, he does. Do you know what percentage uh, of the population is Jewish? What? Guess. Like of the world population? No, yeah, uh, United States. Oh, New York? States. Oh, United States. Ten? Two. OMG. And New York? It's um, like 90. New York, I don't know, but <laughs> it feels like 30. Well, I thought, wasn't it uh, that New York City has more Jews than the state of Israel? I, it's either before, it's either first or second. I can't remember right. yet. It's like the there are more Puerto Ricans in New York City than there are Puerto in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, right. Mm-hmm. right. <laughs> what are you yeah. up to next, Gabriel Arana? Meaning? In life, what you're writing on. What makes you tick tonight? Whatever, whenever. But yeah, what do you? What what's interesting you in the news? Well, I'm writing a piece on the Washington Post and the Guardian getting the FBI to track shooting data better. Oh, do so, tell. So the FBI, the way it tracks police shootings is, it asks the all the police departments in the country uh, to voluntarily send in statistics and then publishes that as authoritative. The entire uh, state of Florida, none of the police departments there submitted anything. That's okay because they're really transparent and progressive. And yeah, no, totally. nothing like Trayvon Martin or anything happens there, <laughs> so we're all good. And so both the Washington Post and the Guardian independently wanted to do an accurate count of the number of police shootings in a given year. They both launched this project, um, and their counts are slightly different. They're getting them from the media, uh, and then they're fact-checking them. But the FBI's numbers are around 400. Uh, both The Guardian and The Washington Post have around 1,000. So that's a huge discrepancy. Whoa. Wait, can you repeat that discrepancy? Yeah. So the number of shootings that the FBI yeah. reports on a national level is below half of what The Washington Post and... So what could account for that? Because police departments don't have to send in the data to the FBI. It's, it's very voluntary. hard for the federal government to make local agencies do anything. So and so I so you're saying that the these publications the Guardian and the Washington Post are more probing than the, F- the FBI. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the the director himself said that this is an embarrassment and a few days later uh, the organization the FBI closed down. <laughs> That's um, how powerful it was. I pause because I, I is it an organization? I guess it is. It's um, a uh, bureau. Yes. A bureau, yeah. Uh, but they 
they're starting a program to keep better track of the number of police shootings. And that's because they knew that you were going to write this report. That's right. It's so damage that, control. That's what I'm writing about. Control. So this awesome. is a case of the media making progress happen yeah. uh, within a federal agency. We need to feel good about ourselves. Yeah. yeah this, is a win. this is a win. This is a win. Yeah. There's yeah. so many losses. We got to celebrate the wins. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Count all the bullets. Count. In, that's the win. Yeah. The win is that we're documenting how violent our world is. Hey, you know what? That's just, if we want to improve, steps. we need yeah. to, we need to, it's to know. Accurately diagnose the problem. Before we treat it. And cure it. Like Unlike a doctor, Ben Carson. Like a tumor. Ben Carson could take to learn something from us. In a child's head. Guys, this is one of the most interesting episodes of the Katie Halper Show. We're going to tell you next uh, next week why it was this way. I'm not going to name the person. I may name him. He's a certain person who, an interesting um, conflict of interest, child rearing and coming on the show. But no snitching, Katie. No snitching. Snitches is for what snitches is it? get stitches. Yeah, exactly. Come on, follow but Cameron's uh, advice. I always no do, and everything else but that. But thank you so much, Gabe Arana. Where can we find you on the Twitters again? Gabriel Gabe Arana. Arana. Um, and at, find him at Having a Post, and we're going to follow you, link to you. Remember, you can check out the Katie Helper Show, and I'm here every week, 6 p.m. on Wednesdays, with Reggie Johnson, Gabe Pacheco, and you can find us on iTunes and SoundCloud, and um, basically. That's it. That's, in a nutshell, that's what we have to say to you. And we will see you next week with Dar Williams, the major folk singer, right? Oh, my God. Gabe Arana. Thank you. He just lip synced to me, really? But he's coming. He's going to come back. Gabe, you you should come back because, you know, because this other Gabe isn't going to be here. I need a Gabe refill. So you want to come? All right. We'll do it. We'll do a Northeastern Connecticut college grads thing. Yeah. (laughs) Wesleyan, whatever. All right. See you guys next week. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. And here, as promised, is our podcast bonus in which Scott Lemieux, the professor of political science at the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York, with a focus on the Supreme Court and constitutional law, goes over for us which of the GOP proposals from the debate this week actually constitute war crimes. Here it is. Take it away, Scott. Cruise and carbon bombings. The only thing that can save Cruz from having advocated a war crime is that his arguments are just incoherent. He's basically describing sort of targeted bombing against ISIS, but carbon bombing by definition means non-targeted bombing. So, you know, carpet bombing is in the vast majority of circumstances a war crime. So the best you can say for Cruz is that he doesn't understand what carpet bombing means. If he's actually advocating carpet bombing, then it's a war crime. Uh, If he wants precision bombing, then obviously that would depend on the circumstances. You know, being declared um, an enemy combatant, certainly major potential for uh, civil liberties abuses. You know, during the Bush administration, there, there was sort of this indiscriminate use of the term enemy combatant to sort of deny people the basic rights of of an ordinary criminal defendant and also to deny people the rights of prisoners of war. And there's simply a a problem with the using the enemy combatant framework, which is that um, we're talking about a conflict that can theoretically be extended everywhere in the world. There's no treaty that can end the war or anything like that. So certainly it is true that American citizenship is not really the issue necessarily. If somebody is genuinely planning to attack the United States, then there may be circumstances in which uh, they can be struck. But, you know, Rubio seems to be implying something a great deal broader. And the sort of argument about the Miranda rights is particularly disturbing because, you know, we heard that argument with the Sharnev bombing in in Boston, the Boston Marathon bombing. And in fact, they were read their Miranda rights and worked out just fine. Part of what I don't like about uh, Rubio's arguments is that he sort of implies that ordinary criminal trials cannot prosecute terrorist suspects. That's simply not true. There may be cases in which somebody is a genuine enemy combatant. There's no way of getting a hold of them. We can have that discussion. But, you know, Rubio seems to be talking about a much broader series of cases that would, um, you know, restore some of the, the more egregious uh, civil liberties abuses of the uh, of the Bush administration. So not a, a war crime, not necessarily, but a, a violation of constitutional rights and human rights. Certainly he's setting up the potential for that on Ben Carson and Innocent children. Uh, I would say that on Carson, it's, it's almost like Cruz, but worse, and that the only thing that can save him from advocating war crimes is that his comments are sort of a lot of words strung together without a lot of content. Resolute understanding, we'll do what needs to be done, etc., etc., etc. 
it's not really, you know, any kind of argument there. Uh, you know, but certainly what I would say about Carson is that, again, war crime or not, what he certainly seems to be advocating is the sort of, you know, completely failed policies of the Bush administration. That if there's a terrorist attack against the United States, what you do is engage in full-scale ground invasions of um, countries, whether or not they necessarily had anything to do with the attack. And, of course, what's particularly ridiculous about this is that it's the destruction of the Iraq state that gave us ISIS in the first place. People were not coming from Iraq to attack the United States before we invaded the country and threw out its government without you know, any possibly viable plan to put a state in its place. Um, and it's exactly those kinds of stateless environments in which terrorists flourish. So not only is this a a bad idea on its own terms in terms of causing a lot of senseless human life and expense, it's actually counterproductive. Ground invasions have a terrible track record of preventing terrorism. So war crime, I don't know, although certainly full-scale invasions tend to produce war crimes, but incredibly stupid, uh, absolutely yes, on Donald Trump and the families. Here, you know, Trump is pretty clearly advocating what in most cases is a war crime. Uh, collective punishment, going after families, of people simply because their family members may have committed crimes is obviously wrong on every possible level. Even what the uh, Israeli state does in terms of destroying the houses of suicide bombers is, you know, very, very questionable as a human rights practice. And I would argue one that in most cases violates human rights. But to actually kill people simply because their relatives committed attacks would be something far worse than that. So that kind of intentional collective punishment is pretty clearly a war crime. Really, I don't think there's, there's even much debate about it. There's a lot of incredibly offensive stuff that the Donald has advocated as his presidential campaign has gained frightening traction. This is, is certainly one of the, uh, one of the worst ones. Uh, Trump. Trump knows just enough to sort of make the specific arguments that Carson won't. More or less, Trump is, just as he is advocating preventing uh, Muslims from being able to enter the country, he's more or less arguing here that the basic First Amendment rights of, uh, of Muslims should be suspended. This is just simply wrong. There are already tools in place uh, to protect actual criminal conspiracies. So, you know, even as, as the great civil libertarian uh, Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black said, uh, you know, the right to freedom of speech ends when it's brigaded with conduct and action. So, you know, Tony Soprano doesn't have a First Amendment right to order uh, Christopher Moltisani to hit somebody, and this applies to any criminal organization up to and including uh, Islamic terrorist groups. But what Trump seems to be advocating is, is something that goes much beyond beyond that, which is to simply say that sort of advocating certain ideas, absent any actual, you know, conspiracy or any actual criminal act, should be prohibited. There is actually a pretty disturbing history of this in our country. As recently as the 50s, people who were not charged with any kind of criminal conspiracy whatsoever could be prosecuted under federal law. The Supreme Court until McCarthyism died, was not willing to protect communists who were being prosecuted solely for their speech. So there is, uh, unfortunately, historical precedent for that. And, of course, Eugene Debs, um, the socialist political leader and labor leader, was uh, given a 10-year prison sentence for giving an anti-World War I speech. Since the late 60s, and really across the political spectrum, there's been sort of an entrenched principle of First Amendment jurisprudence that this kind of prosecution is wrong. Even a Klan rally um, cannot be prosecuted unless there's a direct imminent threat of criminal action. I think this standard is the correct standard, and Trump basically wants to take us back to some of the worst eras of civil liberties abuses in American history, and that's wrong. Basically, unless people are actually planning a criminal conspiracy, they have the First Amendment uh, right to express their views, um, however much we just may disagree with them, and to uh, try to persuade other people to, uh, to agree with them. Well, thank you very much for having me, Kitty.